Hey, it's Rosemary Bauman at Beargrass Creek State Nature Preserve again. And I'm here to share with you some really uh, iconic plants of the eastern forest. Two plants we're going to look at today that are real keystone species. The spice bush and the pawpaw. So here we have the spice bush, Glendera benzoin which is a real, like I said, a real keystone species of the eastern forest. Almost every moist woodland with rich soils either has this plant or it should have it, I would say, which is kind of the case here because we're really trying to get the populations to revive in this woodland. Now the one that's behind me right here, you can see, is a particularly nice female plant. You have flowers on male and female plants, but only berries on the female. So this one's obviously a female. Sometimes you can tell which it's going to be in early spring. The male plants bloom a little bit earlier and have more flowers than the females. These are ripening pretty fast. You can see the deep red ones. And I'm going to take one and Squish it open for you so you can see the seed inside. And mmm, really spicy. Really, really spicy. So there's a nice ripe seed ready to plant. And I'm going to go ahead and plant it somewhere just like a bird would after it ate this part. This is really nutritious stuff. Now the reason that it's called spice bush is there is an aromatic oil in all parts of this plant. In the leaves, in the twigs, and in the berries. And that makes the berries very lipid or fat rich, which means they're a wonderful source of nutrition for migrating thrushes. So around us as we walked in here we saw tons and tons of robins. Pretty soon we'll start seeing the other thrushes like the uh, Swainson's thrush and the hermit thrushes and the wood thrushes will be coming and eating these and then helping us uh, grow more of them because they'll be pooping them out everywhere. <laughs> so in regard to edibility, this plant is pretty interesting because it's really highly edible to some creatures uh, and humans like to use it and it's also really inedible to other creatures, that is to say deer don't browse it. In fact, both the plants we're going to talk about today, one of the reasons that both these plants are doing so well in eastern forests is because deer are doing so well and they totally avoid both of these plants because of the compounds, the chemical compounds that are in them. So again, talking about those aromatic oils, humans, whenever there's a plant that has any sort of properties, <laughs> humans have usually figured out something to do with it, which is a whole really cool subject on its own. Native Americans used the, the plant medicinally in a lot of ways, and I'm not an herbalist, so I'm not going to try to list all of them. But I do know that the berries are probably one of the main interests that people have in them. They can be used fresh or dried, and your uh, urban foragers that have tried this out like to dry them often, and that concentrates the taste and then grind them and use them in place of what you would do with cinnamon and allspice. So in pretty much any sort of apple or fruit recipe that would have used those spices, you can substitute the spice bush berry. All right, so we've been searching these plants carefully and right here on this particular spice bush, we can see that it's being used as a host plant by its species of swallowtail butterfly. So this tiny bit of folded leaf tells us that there's a very tiny first instar caterpillar of the spice bush swallowtail. A beautiful black with a shiny bluish wash on the back. And the cool thing about it is we have one species of Lindera in most eastern forests and it tells you that this, this plant has been around for a long time. To have your own species of butterfly, that's, that's pretty amazing. So over who knows how many hundreds of thousands or even more 
years, they've become adapted to each other and it's protective for the butterfly, just as the monarch is protected by its food plant, the unpalatable oils that are in these leaves helps protect the spice bush swallowtail. Now the, the spice bush swallowtail can use a couple of other plants, including sassafras, but most of the larvae that I've found have been on spice bush. What's really interesting is the other plant we're going to look at today, the pawpaw, also has its very own butterfly. This is one of two groves in our forest that I consider to be the mother or the starter groves that are gradually seeding out into the rest of the area. Now spice bush is really cool because it is not a clonal plant unlike some of the ones in the eastern forest. This huge quantity of seed that you see on the, all these means that this is primarily a seed dispersed plant. So attracting these birds in here to eat them and spread them around can ensure that your adjacent areas get colonized really quickly. And we've seen this process here just on the edge of this. We've been walking around and seeing literally hundreds of small, anywhere from several inches to several feet tall spice bush plants that weren't even here about six years ago. Back in the spice bush grove, got some more heavily fruiting female plants around us. And these areas that we're standing in were completely overwhelmed by bush honeysuckle up until about six, seven, eight years ago. So we've done a complete reversal, removing one plant and allowing the other one to come in naturally by seed. Although in some areas we dig them up and replant them. But what's fascinating is the bush honeysuckle that was here had many characteristics that resemble spice bush, almost as though the two compete for the same niche. And I do believe that's one reason why the bush honeysuckle has been so successful in eastern forests. Not only is it a heavily red berry producing plant that is tall and arches over and stays in that understory zone, but it also has a problem, <laughs> which is that it isn't an exact replica. It not only doesn't have native species that use it, like the spice bush swallowtail, it also has a much denser growth habit. Now, a lot of people like to talk about invasive plants as though they're bad. And they say, oh, the evil bush honeysuckle, it doesn't play nice, blah, blah, blah. Really, all we're talking about is in a plant that's adapted to a different environment. Whatever challenges exist in that environment are apparently not the same here. So it's just doing what any of us would do, I suppose, in an environment where we weren't challenged the same way. We'd probably thrive a little bit better, which is what the bush honeysuckle did. And again, because it wasn't evolved in concert with the other species, it tended to overwhelm them smaller native plants and trees couldn't coexist around this plant because of its heavily shading capabilities. Maybe it lived in a dense, shady environment where that worked, but here it tends to overwhelm some of our more sun-loving natives. At this time of year, we see the bucks running around now with their velvet-covered antlers, and to remove the velvet, they do rub against various kinds of trees and shrubs but a lot of people don't realize that the velvet removal is just the first step in kind of conditioning their antlers for what they're going to be using them for, which is sparring with other bucks. And also, what we, a lot of people don't know is they have a scent gland right on top of their head that produces scent, and scent is very important. So there's a couple of other things that they do, one of which is they seek out plants to rub those antlers against even after the velvet is gone, they like to seek out something that has a certain amount of give. So, a plant like this for a young buck might feel like it's got the same amount of give as another buck that it would be sparring with. Not only that, they seek out plants that are aromatic like sassafras, spice bush, red cedar, black cherry, especially spice bush though. Usually the bucks look for a pretty thick branch, at least an inch or more in diameter, or a stem that's leaning just the right way. They get up against it 
and sometimes they just rip the whole plant to pieces depending on <laughs> what their hormones are like that day but they definitely want to get the scent of that spice bush on their heads so that they can uh, charm the lady deer so to speak with their uh, pleasant mix of uh, aromas so we're here under a giant spice bush i'm trying to gently pull down a branch without breaking it because it's loaded with ripe wow. spice bush berries which we are actually going to sample right. there we go mm. so i it it has a very distinct taste Ooh. to it <laughs> very distinct Ooh. um so yeah, you know, I wouldn't say that it's bad, but it's almost like a candle. Yeah, <laughs> or a grapefruit peel, maybe. Yeah, a very a little bit bitter, <laughs> but in, in terms yep. of a flavoring agent mm -hmm. for different things, mixed in with maybe a little oh, bit yeah. of sugar or something like that, I could see why people would use it. They totally shine when, especially when they're dried down a little and concentrated, and then mixed with sweeter things. They give it that kind of little punch that right. you want out of a spice. I probably wouldn't be eating raw spices either, so <laughs> right, right. I'm not used to <laughs> flavors that strong. Boy, I'll tell you, if I was a bird, I would have absolutely no problem with it. Of course, birds don't have teeth and they don't really chew either, mm. but they really suck these down. This is uh, good stuff. It, it tastes like a candle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, really it does. does. It does taste like a candle. <laughs> Because candles have a lot of fat in them right, too, and right. this is a high fat thing, yeah. This is Rosemary again, and we have been down in the spice bush grove, looked for the ripe fruits, even popped a few in our mouth, and uh, made a sour face, <laughs> and learned some really cool things about how this plant grows and thrives at Beargrass Creek State Nature Preserve. Yeah, and again, guys, thank you so much for watching Beargrass Thunder. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe our videos. We have a lot more material coming out, and especially we want to teach you guys how to grow native plants in your own backyard. <laughs>